A good Sunday afternoon uh, to everybody and hope that you are having a good day. And if you want to, at this time, uh, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 26 today. Um, we had just finished chapter 25, really chapters 24 and 25, where Jesus had quite a long discourse um, there and warning of things coming, the destruction of Jerusalem being one, and uh, then in chapter 25 gave some final parables there. Jesus has done, as we have been studying through, reading through and studying through the Gospel of Matthew, we've seen Jesus come into the world, we've seen Jesus teaching many people in many places in many different ways, and we've seen Jesus perform a lot of different miracles and fulfilling a lot of different prophecies. Uh, throughout the gospel account of Matthew. And we've seen a lot of opposition against Jesus throughout all of this. We've seen a lot of faith in Jesus as well. But now as we near the end of Matthew's gospel account, we know that this is where we get to the climax of things, at least in regards to what was going to happen to Jesus. And so in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 1 here today, uh, that after Jesus had done many things and after he had finished his most recent teachings there in chapters 24 and 25 that we can read, that it says it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that Jesus said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Um, Jesus is actually, and what the Gospel of Matthew um, tells us, is that there were several occasions in which Jesus gave a heads up to his disciples as to what was going to be coming, what was going to be happening to Jesus, that he was going to be denied, he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be arrested and mocked, and uh, that he would eventually be crucified. He would be killed by crucifixion. And so this was hard for the disciples to hear. They didn't really understand what exactly Jesus was saying to them, um, at least of, you know, really how these things would come about. I think in large part, it was kept from them to fully understand what was going to happen to Jesus until they went through it with him, or at least saw what he went through and wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, would not be until after his death and resurrection that they would finally fully understand it all and as he would reveal it to them. But but here he is telling them, you know, the Passover is just a couple of days away and after that the Son of Man or there uh, with the Passover, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And it is then that we are told, Kona, the, the, the camera sort of changes uh, to someone else and that is, that we are told that then the chief priests of the Jews and the scribes of the Jews and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. And it says they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. And so we've seen several occasions thus far where the people and the Jewish leaders have been mad at Jesus. They've not liked what Jesus has had to say and teach and all the attention that he is getting and, um, you know, pointing out the hypocrisy of many of these Jewish leaders. And we've seen other times where they've they've tried to maybe do something to Jesus, but nothing's ever really come of it. They have failed to arrest Jesus. Well, here it says, though, they are still plotting to take Jesus by deception by trickery to get him arrested and ultimately what they want to do is unfortunately and sadly is they want to kill Jesus they want to get rid of him but one thing they said verse 5 is they did not want to do it during the feast of the Passover lest there be an uproar among the people because you know many of the people they were believing in Jesus um, even if you know some of them you know, only believed in Jesus as far as, you know, believing that he was a great prophet. Um, you know, even if they didn't fully understand or believe him to be the Christ, many of the people knew that there was something very great and, and special about Jesus. And so uh, the Jewish leaders, they were afraid of what the people would do or think if they, um, you know, saw them arresting Jesus and 
having him killed. So they wanted to do it in a, a secret time, or they wanted to do it in a more advantageous time for them to uh, do it unawares of the, or the people to not know uh, really what was going on until it was too late. Um, so Jesus has warned his disciples of what is coming. The Jewish leaders are plotting against Jesus. And then as all of this is taking place, something in the midst of all of this, something beautiful happens here, beginning in verse 6, that when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he is there spending time with Simon the leper in Bethany that a woman comes to Jesus. She came to Jesus having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she begins to pour it on his head as he sat at the table. Uh, this woman comes and she, as Matthew is telling it at least, she comes and she begins to anoint Jesus with this very fragrant, very expensive oil. But when the disciples of Jesus saw it, verse 8, they were indignant, saying, why this waste for this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And in other gospel accounts, when this is told, we actually find out that this was instigated, really, by Judas Iscariot, who we're going to read about in just a moment, because this is kind of a somewhat of a, I think, a final straw for Judas. We know Judas, what we learn and we're going to learn here is, you know, one thing Judas, one of the very disciples, one of the special disciples of the 12 that Jesus called, specifically sort of the inner circle of disciples that Jesus had, Judas Iscariot struggled with greed. Um, he struggled with greed. He would steal from from the disciples. He would steal from Jesus as he was the uh, treasurer. Uh, he was the holder of their money. Um, Judas really instigated this unrest in the disciples that um, this woman has come and she has wasted this oil. Um and he wasn't really concerned about the poor, but rather he wanted to keep the money for himself. But nevertheless, in all of that, as the disciples have been riled up and they're upset that this oil has been wasted, Jesus now wants them to understand that this oil was not wasted. As a matter of fact, this oil was used for the high, one of the highest purposes it could be used for, if not the highest purpose it could be used for. As Jesus answers them in verse 10 and says, as he was aware of their, you know, fussing about this oil being used, he says to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me, he says, you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial." Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. What Jesus does here is he again is revealing to them, is preparing them for what's coming. He says that she has, in using this oil, she is really anointing him in a a figurative way, in a uh, ceremonial way for his burial that's coming, his death. Um, and this should have caught the attention of the disciples. This should have, much as he had just told them and as he had done before, and you know, Jesus trying to tell them what was coming and how he was going to be arrested, how he was going to be killed. And here he is telling them that he is being anointed with this oil for his burial, his death. He says, he even told them in verse 11, you're not always going to have me. You'll always have the poor, but I'm not going to be with you forever. You will not always have me. I mean, first and foremost, because he was about to die. But then even after his death and his resurrection, he would not be on earth forever. We will find out later that, it, that he would eventually ascend back to the Father in heaven. But he says this was for his burial. His burial. And what's special about this even is what he says of this woman. I believe uh, the other gospel accounts, I'm 
not remembering. I think this was actually Mary who did this. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to cross-reference um, this. But Jesus says, you know, even as Jesus is preparing for this and as the gospel is about Jesus and as Jesus is preparing for his death and burial and resurrection, and even as we'll see, Lord willing, next Sunday as he's going to institute a memorial for himself in the Lord's Supper, he is still noting the faith and love of this woman who has done something special for him. As he says there in verse 13, that wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done right now will also be told as a memorial to her. Jesus was impressed with her faith, with her love, with her care. We're still, we have it recorded for us in Matthew's gospel and in other gospels. We have it, we're, we're still in the, the whole world. We're still talking about what she did, as just as Jesus said we would. Because of the special things she did in honor of Jesus. And Jesus getting ready for his death and burial. Well, then we'll look at a few more verses today with what was going on, because after this, we know that Jesus at the beginning of this chapter in chapter 26 was warning his disciples, preparing them for what was coming, how he was going to be rejected and arrested and he was going to die, be, be crucified. We then see the, the Jewish leaders plotting, trying to figure out how they could trick Jesus and how they could get him to be put to death. And then we see this instance when this woman comes and she uses this ointment. And as the other gospel tells us, that is really Judas Iscariot who is upset about this. And as we read on in verses 14 through 16, obviously Judas really missed the point and was not really paying attention and thinking about what Jesus was saying because all that Judas could see was his own greed his own desire for money because it is after this and I don't I don't think it's coincidence. You know, Judas must have been offered or heard of the plot, knew what was going on and now that he sees this wasted opportunity for financial gain with this oil, well now he he thinks back at least as it plays out in Matthew's gospel that now one of the 12 verse 14 had, or who was called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, Judas sought opportunity to betray Jesus. For money. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the chosen 12, one of the called, he was... And the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, some, you know, who were some of the closest to Jesus, they were with Jesus often. They saw, you know, the miracles Jesus did more than anybody. They heard the teachings of Jesus, even had many of his teachings explained just to them and even did some teaching and healing themselves. And Judas was a part of all of that. But even though Judas was a special disciple of Jesus, closest, one of the closest to Jesus, at least in that regard, uh, he, his heart was not very close to Jesus in some respects because of his greed for money. And it had gotten so bad to the point that now Judas is even willing. Judas is willing to use an opportunity to betray his master, to betray his teacher, to betray the Christ, to betray the Son of God, to betray Jesus who had done so many good things, who was perfect, who was loving, who was powerful and great and wonderful. But now Judas is willing to find a time to betray Jesus into the hands of the Jewish authorities all for a little bit of money. Now, in some respects, I mean, 30 pieces of silver may have been an okay amount to some in that culture and at that time, And but, but in our own standard, 
and our own currency. You know, the gist of it is, you know, 30 pieces of silver was really, in our standards today, was really not all that much. But Judas saw it as an opportunity to get a little bit of financial gain that he was willing to betray the most special person on the face of the earth. Which there's a lesson in and of that, all of this, that we could talk about Judas and we could talk about greed and we could talk about secret sins and we could talk about giving into those sins. And that's what Judas did. And that's what we're going to end up seeing later on in this chapter. But for today, we're going to stop there where things are beginning to really get bad. The plot is building against Jesus. The Jewish leaders are plotting against him. Judas has conspired against him. And now Judas is just waiting for an opportunity. An opportunity that would work for the Jewish leaders like they want. But even in the midst of all of this darkness, we see something beautiful like we just mentioned of this woman coming to anoint Jesus and Jesus commending her faith and her love. We'll stop there and Lord willing next week we'll pick up and see what happens next as things begin to build and the climax begins to really get worse. And we'll see what will eventually lead up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And with this being Sunday, let's remember all of this, especially as we partake of the Lord's Supper and as we worship God today with it being the first day of the week and in every day of our lives, remembering why Jesus came, how he lived, what he did, what he taught, what he went through, what he's going to go through as we're going to read here. And just remember Jesus and remember what he came to do for us. And give thanks to God. God bless.